Okay, so I think uh, we're all very concerned that we were going to have to dance at the beginning of the session. I'm very happy to discover that's not going to be required of uh, myself or any of the other contributors. Um, this has been an amazing pleasure. I think uh, you've already grasped a little bit the excitement we have of being here. Um, Spain is the second largest producer of uh, greenhouse produced food. and. This is the epicenter of that. So from that perspective, we're here to learn. Uh, we're here to participate. And I think that this conference has already demonstrated through the academic part what is possible. I'm going to take a few minutes at the beginning here. Um, hopefully, uh, my panel will agree with some of my comments. But uh, to give a sense of why I'm excited by agriculture and where I see the opportunities for us um, as investors, as people involved in agribusiness and food, and not least for you who are looking for careers in the sector in the future. Yes, yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about the different technologies that are transforming the world. And um, from that perspective, <coughs> there are 30 technologies they say are the most critical. However, within those, we know technologies go through what they call the Gartner hype cycle where we hear about this technology and it's going to change everything about the future of food production. It's going to be exciting in terms of how it transforms what we do. And then it seems as though after a couple of years, investors aren't so excited. And as that excitement goes away, we enter almost a valley of disappointment, a valley of despair, concerned as to whether this will ever help. I'm thinking about blockchain. I'm thinking about the use of gene editing. I'm thinking about some of the things that have happened in cellular meats and in, um, even in, in vertical farming. So I've taken 10 of these and felt that let's go through 10 that maybe from a career perspective you should be thinking about. So when I think about controlled environmental agriculture, clearly we've seen over the last few years um, Funding being received by some of these larger vertical farms, particularly in the United States, became huge. And then it felt as though people became very disappointed. Okay, so it saves water, so it saves energy. What can it actually do? Are the food miles really critical? Doesn't it bring other issues? And we've seen the valuations of some companies go down quite a lot. And yes, at the same time, the technologies we've learned, the use of AI, the use of sensors, the use of precision are now being applied in greenhouses, not just here in Almeria, but also in the Netherlands, in China, in the United States, all over the world. So for me, this controlled environmental agriculture is a business which will continue to be exciting. And it's something that I think, uh, if I'm thinking about my future career, food will not always be produced just outside. It will also be produced, uh, maybe my, 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 my friend and former colleague, colleague from COVAP might not agree, but uh, future will continue to be produced outside, but increasingly this controlled environmental agriculture offers us the opportunity to be very precise in our use of resources. Second technology I'm very excited by, CRISPR, gene editing. Yes, CRISPR. It seemed as though it was going to change everything. CRISPR is the scissors that allows us to precisely edit the genes of plants, of animals, some people even say humans, and certainly has, in the same way as it is in our body, the ability to repair bad DNA, to re remove DNA, which maybe doesn't help us from a productivity perspective, uh, from a disease perspective. And while investors were first excited and then less excited, we are now seeing foods coming to market with really interesting potential. Uh, these are just three examples from a company in, um, in North Carolina, where I live, called Pearwise. They have cherries with no seeds. They have blackberries with no seeds. I'm not too sure why we need blackberries with no seeds, but apparently people who don't grow up with blackberries would like them to have no seeds. And they're also producing a mustard leaves without the mustard flavor, which it contains more fiber, 
contains more nutrients than typical lettuce or, or other greens. Third area, can farming, can farms become a power plant? And this is particularly the case in the dairy industry, but we're seeing it with all types of livestock. Clearly the land has the opportunity for wind power, for solar power, for maybe um, also heating water by putting it down deep into the earth, but methane or methane, depending on which version of English you like to speak, uh, the me methane production through biodigesters is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. It's interesting to see what this affects. Agrovoltaics, uh, a business which is in growing and interest is where you actually have agriculture in the same fields as solar panels. And from that perspective, what do animals do? Some of them take shade underneath the solar panels, the sheep do. In the case of the photograph on the right, maybe not quite so clear, but you can actually see beef cows are shading underneath the shadow of a wind turbine. So the opportunity to mix these different things together and how animals or livestock or crops adapt to that could be very exciting for our future, our mixed use of land. If we think about uh, synthetic biology, again, it feels as though we've gone through that hype cycle of excitement through to despair. Um, some of the challenges we're having in replacing meat with meat alternatives are that we're using stem cells, not easy to find. We're using a lot of antibiotics, antimicrobials, causes other issues. The infrastructure of the fermentation structures that would be required just for the United States would be into the trillions of dollars. So a lot of investors wondering, will this ever, will this ever achieve uh, true sustainability or accessibility? Um, but actually, we're also seeing the replacement of milk proteins, etc., cetera, um, through fermentation. There's just a lot of exciting things happening. Sustainable aviation fuel, um, clearly those of you that came from by airplane, possibly wondering, uh, will we ever be able to come by airplane guilt-free from a climate perspective? If we're going to fuel our planes sustainably, then agriculture is fundamentally going to be involved. And, um, you know, 98% of aviation's carbon footprint comes from fuel and realistically biofuels produced by agriculture will be the only way that this can be done. A lot of what we're seeing in Brazil in particular with respect to this is extremely exciting. Next idea, um, digital agriculture. And what I mostly heard last year when I spoke to you about digital agriculture was where is the place for humans? How can we, as students, be excited by the idea of digital agriculture? What jobs will we have? And I'm thinking in particular of the healthcare industry, hospitals. When you go into hospitals today, you see sensors, you see iPads, you see robots, you see all of these technologies being embraced, but what you don't see is less doctors, you don't see less nurses, and you don't see less healthcare professionals. So it's changing the nature of work, not replacing work. And you know, all of these technologies together, clearly from my perspective, are going to be very important about you thinking as you leave college, as you leave your, your, your postgraduate programs, do you know how to code? Do you know how to write algorithms? Do you know how to engage with artificial intelligence, not just as a purchaser, but actually understand what it does? Uh, AI. Artificial intelligence, as Seth Godin said, is it really artificial or is it really intelligent? What absolutely it's doing is changing the nature of work. However, I was at a conference last week in Austria. I was introduced using uh, ChatGPT and it got it completely wrong. Uh, it was using parts of my career from four years ago and um, did not seem to know how things had changed. So ChatGPT is an exciting technology I was at another conference where they were asked, they used ChatGPT to say, is it good to eat meat? And according to ChatGPT, it is not good to eat meat because you might get more cancer and heart disease. And yet the report it based it on, a Lancet report, was subsequently refuted because it showed that when you consume meat and other animal proteins, overall your health is better. Uh, as part of a balanced diet, of course, but it shows you how if the information going into these AI systems is not complete, then you get an incomplete answer. 
If I think about the next idea, the metaverse, I don't know if you've thought about this as a career, as a, or an area of research or an area for investment, but the metaverse also provides tremendous opportunities for the food industry. Um, from my perspective, it's about enhancing the ability to observe what's happening in the food chain, the origin and providence of that food, how to train operators, improving efficiency and safety, and enhancing the consumer experience. And my own example of this was when I went to China, I saw that in the HEMA, it's a HEMA is a, a grocery store set up by Alibaba. They're actually using QR codes so that you can see where the food came from, how it was produced, um, you can watch videos, you can see the labeling. So this is a kind of version of uh, enhanced reality which exists already today and we'll we will see more of in the future. Robotics, back to will we be replaced? Um, we certainly do see robotics, obviously, in all aspects of the food chain, milking cows, processing animals, picking things up and moving them around in any of our vegetable processing, flower processing, and particularly these uh, soft robots. Uh, this video plays. Oh, did not, know. But the soft robot has fingers that are capable of picking up eggs or meat or milk, um, eggs or meat or soft produce and not damaging it as it moves it from side to side. The last area I want to cover is proactive um, human health. So what could we do from a human health perspective? And Jason Lusk, uh, uh, who, of course, the Dean of uh, the University of Oklahoma. He's also on the board of IFAM, and we're having this discussion. At what point will humans continue to be allowed to make choices over what we eat? Now, this is a little bit contentious and maybe something that would concern you. What do you mean somebody be making that choice? But you can imagine increasingly the influence of insurance companies, etc., could have saying, if you eat certain foods, as if you engage in other risky behaviors such as smoking and drinking, to what degree could your insurance premiums go up? I don't know if we're going to quite see that big bad world, but we are increasingly seeing prescriptions of if you want to reduce your risks of certain diseases, here's what you should do from a health perspective. And I think it's also instructive to think about the microbiome. We know how many bacteria there are in our bodies. Perhaps feeding them is more important than feeding ourselves. At least that's what certain people tell us. And thinking about some of the foods that could have that influence are very important. These are 10 areas for me that I would love to see IFAMA researching, IFAMA researchers researching. These are 10 areas I think if you think about your future careers, you should think about as well. These are 10 areas I think about from an investment perspective. And hopefully those will be part of the themes that we see over the next two days of this business conference. Um, I, am, uh, I do need to take the moment to say I am launching at the conference uh, my book in Spanish. So this is the fourth language. We had last year the launch in, in Chinese, Mandarin, Chinese, and also in Portuguese. It contains many of the ideas I've discussed here today, and obviously you've got the QR code there, but um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be at the IFAMA conference. It's a pleasure and an honor to be the president of IFAMA and I'm looking forward to the next, uh, next couple of days. So if I could, um, maybe we'll pass on to a panel to get into more depth on some of the themes that we've explored already this morning. Thank you very much. So I'm going to pass, uh, rather than running the panel myself, as was originally on the program, um, Professor Thea Hennessy, University College Cork, who's the Dean of the College of Business and Law, is going to um, give us the opportunity to engage a panel of those who understand Spanish agriculture, can give you some understandings of the nature of technology and how it's being embraced, and how technology is also being used globally. So, Professor Hennessy. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's great to be here, and thanks to Aidan for inviting uh, me to moderate this panel. And thanks as well for that fantastic overview he gave of the 10 trends affecting the future of agriculture and food. Some really exciting uh, developments no, no, no. covered there and exciting technologies. So we have a, a, a great panel here this morning on the stage joining us. We have uh, representatives from Spain and from Brazil and we're going to pick up on some of the topics that Aidan has just um, 
introduced. So what I'm going to do is maybe start by asking each of you to introduce yourself and your organization and describe what your organization does. And we have a, a microphone. A lot of background noise. Just to make sure you're all awake and listening. Yeah? Good. <laughs> okay, Marcelo. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcelo. I'm an associate professor at the University of Brasilia. I'm CEO of the Crew Tech, and uh, my company basically works with nanotechnology based on carbon nanodots to create biostimulants to, 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 to agriculture. Uh, my history, briefly, is, is interesting because uh, between 2011 and 2015, I was working with cancer, investigate the dynamic of the organelles, the dynamic of the metabolic process in cancer cells. So I present my results to Embrapa, and uh, Dr. Jusima told me, Marcelo, forget cancer, come to be happy in other business, and uh, I decided to focus my, my research in to understand the, the plant physiology and how my our nanoparticles can up, up or down regulate specific metabolic process. In 2019, we have created the company with my PhD students and uh, start our activity in 2000, 2021. And uh, now we have uh, some products in the Brazilian market and uh, the results are very interesting. It, it sometimes scare the, the, the the farm holders. Good morning, everybody. My name is Arturo Lizon Nordstrom. I'm the global director of the Mavi Lab uh, from Kimitech. Uh, I'm leading a very innovative way of uh, promoting agriculture, different technologies uh, directly to the grower. I think that I work for Kimitech. Kimitech is a company that is based here outside Valen uh, Valencia, outside Almeria. And uh, for me, probably is the, one of the most innovative companies in, the, in Spain, in the ag space. They are dealing with different type of innovation, product innovation in the natural space. They are leading also AI solutions just to faster up or to speed up the, the this the development of different solutions. And also, and that's what I'm leading, we are innovating in channels, not only through the distribution, but also directly to the grower, and finding new business model, which I think is very, very interesting, or is very needed in agriculture. Great. <clears throat> so thank you. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Molina. I'm the CEO of uh, Hispatec. Uh, thank you to, to invite us uh, to be here. So we are a company that we are headquartered here in, in Almeria. We are present as well in uh, some other countries in Latin America. We are a company focused on software and data uh, for the uh, specialty crops uh, market segment in, inside the agri-food uh, area. So mainly fruits, vegetables, and then cocoa, coffee, olive oil, vineyard. Uh, we are roughly uh, 200 people, so in general, people like agronomists, um, industrial engineers, computer science, mathematicians, so I would say boring people, but that we like agri-food sector and technology and innovation. That's what we do basically, and our uh, main focus is to make real the digitalization farm to market in such a way that we can stop talking about island of digitalization, that is basically what we have in many areas as of today, and in such a way that the data can be born in digital format and travel all over the chain up to the consumer and generating a real uh, digital link between consumers and producers, transformers, and commercialization companies. So the agri-food chain is, is pretty complex and it has quite a lot of agents. So our main goal is to align digitally that uh, supply chain and to make it bidirectional 
and to fulfill uh, the, the main three challenges, I would say, that are economic uh, sustainability, so it has to be efficient, uh, environmental sustainability and social sustainability. Those are our main leading uh, principles in our activity. And thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm Joaquin Pozo, R&D Director at BioRizon Biotech. I'm also co-founder of the company. Uh, BioRizon Biotech is a multinational company working on decarbonizing biotechnology for sustainable agriculture. Finally, we, we, we are the pioneer, uh, world pioneer developing and commercializing microalgae based agricultural products. Actually, uh, we are uh, producing our own raw material, our microalgae biomass, uh, which uh, we are processing into biostimulant and biopesticide products. And at the same time, uh, we are working on sustainability because we are uh, able to capture up to two kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of uh, uh, biomass that we are producing. Uh, we are commercializing in 42 countries around the world. Uh, headquarters is here located in Almería, the Technological Park, and also with subsidiary companies in Peru, Chile, Ecuador, Mexico, uh, India, and Italy. Um, in this moment, spending, growing a lot. Thank you. thinking about some questions you'd like to ask, but maybe we'll hear some more from the panel first. So can, can you tell me some more about the, the products then you're developing? Are they to be adopted by growers or farmers? How do they work within the supply chain, your uh, decarbonization technology? Uh, finally, uh, we are uh, using the, the wonderful raw material that is the mycology, where we are able to, to identify and, 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 and extract uh, very interesting uh, amounts of phytohormone, natural phytohormone, antioxidant uh, uh, protein that we process into different amino acids. Finally, we are uh, producing different uh, biostimulant products, biopesticide, always uh, looking at the, 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 to increase the yield of the, of the farmers and uh, also uh, looking forward to maximize the, the, the productivity and the, the um, all the advantage that we can be uh, provide to, to, to for farming uh, under uh, always uh, looking for the sustainability of the new agricultural products because uh, uh, we we are working very focused on the on the new challenge of this agriculture and we are trying to to obtain different natural products we are not getting finally the 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 end, the end consumer. We are always uh, working with uh, distributor dealers uh, in different countries, but we are very close uh, to our farmers because uh, we are providing directly our uh, uh, support uh, with our uh, agriculture technician. Okay, thank you. And I might come back to you, Jose, on on the digitalization of agriculture. And it was one of the ten trends that Aidan picked out there. So you're obviously very in that space. What, is there a particular part of the supply chain you're focusing on and where are you seeing fastest rates of adoption? So, so basically, uh, well, we are, uh, as a company, we are focusing pre-harvest and post-harvest. So basically, both of them are important. And, and in fact, uh, I would say um, the European Union has created five years ago that kind of uh, motto of farm to fork. Uh, basically, there are many things below that, but one of them that I think is pretty important is just to, to have a real link between what's happening in the pre-harvest, in the, in the field, and what's happening then in the post-harvest, and then in the logistics and distribution. So uh, I think it's completely essential that we uh, succeed in the purpose of digitalizing, fully digitalizing the full chain. If we take a look to the big challenges worldwide, in the agri-food sector. Uh, one of them is food loss and waste. Uh, as of today, and according to FAO numbers, and a study in the year 21, 31% uh, 30, of all the food that is produced in the world, not only produced, but harvested in the world, so someone has taken the work, the effort, to harvest it. 31% of that food is not arriving to any human stomach. Mm -hmm. So meaning that one, one every three apples are there in the rubbish. 
So, uh, and, and basically, if we talk about uh, perishable goods, if we talk about uh, fruits and vegetables, that percentage is not 31, it's 40 or 50%. So, if we don't afford the digitalization with a full perspective farm to market, mm -hmm. so we can be losing quite a lot of vision on many exchanges, on many interfaces in the middle of the different agents all over the supply chain in such a way that we won't afford in the right way that big challenge. So it's fundamental that we succeed in the purpose of, of fully digitalizing the supply chain um, and uh, forgetting about that kind of island concept of arriving with a, an app saying that you are going to be the guy that with an app is going to change mm -hmm. the world. So, sorry, but that's not going to happen. Supply chain in the agri-food sector is much more complex than that. And it's fundamental, that link, digital link, and to make it be bidirectional, such a way that it's not only a, a, an, an, an ascending supply chain, but it's very good to receive the feedback from the consumers, from the market, to understand where your product is being uh, consumed, which is the feedback of your consumers, and so on. Mm -hmm. And if you take that example of food waste, what are the types of digital tools that are being developed to tackle that? I mean, you talked about in the field, pre-harvest. Is there a technology there? So, so for example, things like uh, claims. So, uh, as far as, so first thing to improve a process, you need metrics, you need numbers. So, other than, so we are, uh, we are prophets of uh, data telling rather than storytelling. So when we talk about claims, if we measure claims and reasons of those claims in the final destination, so we can work on the main reasons of those claims in such a way that they can be reduced by one third or by 50%, and that means much more fruits and vegetables that are arriving in the proper conditions to the final market. That's mm -hmm. one example, but we can mention many others. So things like only harvesting the kind of fruits and vegetables that are going to be accepted in the market, other than harvesting everything, and then we will see later on, because the cost that you are incurring in the harvest, and then in processing those fruits later on in the industry, in terms of water, energy, workforce, etc., are huge. Mm -hmm. So let's decide in a much more segmented way in every single uh, step of the supply chain. Okay. Thank you. We might move on to Orturo. That's oh, okay. Thank you. So, uh, like, I suppose I come from Ireland. It rains a lot. It's very green. The cows are in the field, and I come here, and the agriculture is so different. Um, the plastic. Is water a big challenge? What are the particular innovations you're really focusing on in this region? Well, water is a challenge around the world, yeah. even in Spain even more. Now, this year has been raining a lot, but I mean, last year it was like a big drought and uh, the, all the companies suffered a lot. I think water is a part, part of that challenge, no? but mm -hmm. uh, there are many other challenges. I mean, we are building a lot of uh, uh, facilities just to take the, the water from the sea and make, uh, that makes it more expo uh, expensive, but it wor it's working actually. But I think there are other challenges in the, for me, in agriculture, the big challenge is the adoption of new technologies mm -hmm. in the final customer, which is the farmer. No? Uh, I'm coming from the human health uh, uh, industry. Last five years, I was CEO of an ag company. And what I saw was that a metaphor that, that you can, that you, well, what you saw in the human health uh, is going to happen also in the agribusiness. Uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you were taking a lot of medicines to just to, um, uh, become health, no? or be health, not mm -hmm. healthy. The big transformation of human health was the creation of habits and prevention. Okay? That has a lot of to do with what is happening in agriculture now. You, you are used to use pesticides. What you have to do is just to introduce technology just in the preventive side of the, of the, of the management of the crop. No? And that's what we are doing at, at, at Kimitech. We are not just developing technologies, we are not just developing new products, better ways of, of, of management, of water management. But what I think is the real challenge is talking directly to the grower and 
of course, training the distributor, but talking directly to the grower to adapt new ways of management of the of the crop. No, that's mm -hmm. I think that's what I believe is the the big challenge. Mm. And are the growers receptive to that information? Are they yeah. adopting? Yes, I think. Yeah, I mean. Uh, the, the 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 ag industry was very stiff in the in the way they manage their challenge their channels. I think that is changing. A big growers there is a big concentration of growers now all over the places because private equity is buying growers and making platforms that allows companies like Imitech and other another technology companies to direct direct directly to a grower who are actually the ones that are going to use it. No. Distributors have always been very stiff, very like a wall, like a wall garden, and now they have to react. So there is a lot of channel innovation and also business models. No, yes, they are they are becoming more and more aware that they have to talk with us because what we are trying is to personalize the different solutions to their real needs, and the needs in agriculture are very local. Mm -hmm. So you have to. Is no no one size fits all. It says we develop the product, but we also develop the how you de how you manage the crop in that location. What are you using? What are the types of, of of solutions that you need for your crop and your location and your country? So that's the I think personalization is is the is the key for 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 being successful with the grower. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, so, we'll go to the floor shortly for questions. We might get a microphone on the floor if we have one, but we'll come back first to Marcelo. So, tell us about the growing market for biologicals in, in Brazil then. Sure. Brazil is leader in terms of the biological adaptation. Uh, the problem, the challenge to produce in tropical agriculture is the pressure of disease and pests is huge and um, the efficiency of the conventional chemicals is decreasing along annually. So Brazil depend 80% of to import of the, the, the defensives. So the biological was alternative to increase the profit, the, the margin of the, the agricultures, uh, the farmers. So in the, for this reason, uh, the abduction is growing quickly. The, it's around 20% per year. So there are uh, several alternatives to control fungal disease, bacteria infections, uh, control pests using fungals or bacteria. It's, it's an elegant alternative to Brazilian agriculture to be more sustainable. So. And I think that Brazil did it very well with the registration policy, no? Yeah, Because yeah. almost, I think, 65% of the products that are registered in Brazil are biologicals. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is a, is a dream in, in Europe. I mean, it takes six years. The, you are all the time fighting with, with Brussels about the different studies. And Brazil was, I think it was it's the key, no? The yeah. key thing. Yeah, the, the, the legislation in Brazil is very uh, quick in terms of the registration of the products. And uh, it's an uh, important key point to, to adoption mm -hmm. of the, the, the technology. Yeah. Yeah. And that small companies can actually yeah. target yeah. big growers. No? Mm. We have a, a large number of the small companies produce biologicals. And uh, we have uh, the, the, the farm holders can produce in-house. Mm. And is it the early adopters, are they mostly the large growers or is it a mixture yeah. across? Yeah, large growers okay. is adopting the, the, the it's, biological is a reality in Brazil. It's uh, basically a great part of the, 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 the producers uh, is, are adopting. The growers are producing their own biologicals in their own facilities. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, producing Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we'll see if we have any questions from the floor. We've Aiden in the front and then gentleman behind him. So maybe we know who you are, but if other people could introduce themselves, it would be good. Thank you. The question is, um, fertilizer seems to be the biggest conversation we have. Can we replace fertilizer? Is it possible to have agriculture with no fertilizer? Okay, the question is, can we have agriculture without fertilizer? 
who would like to take that challenge? It's a good question. Uh, in my previous company, as I, I, was, I was the CEO, we had some solutions based on microbials that actually were replacing 100% the fertilizers. There is really, you have some examples in Valencia where they grow their oranges without any fertilizer, just using microbials to carbon fixing, uh, uh, phosphor uptake, uh, potassium uptake, and it worked very well. I think probably it's a little bit aggressive, but you can reduce a lot. I think it's a field where you can actually improve a lot your products. Actually, actually, actually in Valencia there is a special situation because the, both water and ground has, uh, have accumulated a lot of uh, uh, primary nutrients and that's the reason because micro microbial solutions are working so well. Well, I no, don't agree. Mm. Because those farms... Well, I don't really agree because those farms have been using microbials 15 years. And that could be what you're saying, it could be true the first and the second and the third year, but not after that. I think that the carbon fixing, um, nitrogen fixing bacteria could be very powerful in order just to reduce the dosage. Well, that's my opinion. Reduce the dosage. We are here just to discuss. <laughs> no? Yeah, controversial question. Good, get the debate going. Would you like to comment? Well, in our experience, you are observing that it's possible to optimize the use of the fertilizers. Uh, uh, if you are activating the plant metabolism using biostimulants, uh, the necessity of the, the, the quantity of the, 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 the fertilizer deposited on the soil, you can optimize. Mm -hmm. I have some ex interesting ex examples, of course, in, in lab conditions, but it's possible to reduce 20, 30 percent of the quantity mm -hmm. of the fertilizer activating the plant metabolism. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, I would say, I think that that's pretty challenging, that question, so if we can avoid completely fertilization, so I would say the first enemy in fertilization should be lixiviation, should be uh, fertilizer losses. That's what is really damaging uh, the pocket in terms of money and the environment. So basically, first thing when we talk about fertilization is measuring, so measuring precisely how much fertilizer are we putting there, how much is going to the groundwater or the rivers or so, because that's pretty painful and that's generating quite a lot of noise in the, in the society. And that should be the first enemy. And for sure, if we measure, that's probably something that we are only doing in, in 10 or 20% of the land. Uh, so we should do it in 100% if we are properly measuring. So we should be capable to improve in a very re uh, relevant way in the short term and then reducing that lixiviation. That, that's the first enemy. Yeah, we need to have the baseline and yeah. to monitor. Okay. Uh, in the second row here, we have another question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll, we'll go back there. I didn't realize you had a microphone. Ah, here. Okay. Hello. My name is Raj Warden, and I've been an industry practitioner in the field of agriculture for 30 years. I'm on the board of a farm. Um, those of you who don't know me, uh, this, when, when I come to Almeria, uh, the words which are leaping to my mind is, this is food system magic. And I, you understand this in the context of EU possibly. I'm not even sure if you realize the leadership position you can play for small farming systems in Asia, in Africa. And I'm not even sure if you're thinking in that side. And when I look at scale of farming here and what is replicable across the globe, this could be mind-boggling. So what is interesting for me is from where you started, Herman said this was, you know, the most poorest region of Spain and we heard this morning of what's the contribution in financial terms, employment, uh, technology, innovation, everything, you name any metrics, the kind of change which has happened. So I'm just trying to think what are the preconditions which are prevailing here? Uh, it's not just the water resources, 
or land because you see mountains and you realize, okay, there's lots of wasteland here, uh, what's here, which makes this magic. And I'm wondering, is there policy-related intervention which is possible uh, to create this magic, this kind of a hub globally across continents? Okay, thank you. So how can we transfer this to small holders? Anybody want to take up yep. that challenge? So I would say one of the key points uh, I would say is organization. Uh, we are talking, we've been talking since the beginning of the morning about cooperatives, about agronomists, about farmers, all of them working in an integrated way. So, uh, and that's crucial because that has created the basis for uh, a better financing uh, activity for the sector, uh, innovation, scale economies, commercialization, and so on. So at the end of the day, I would say absolutely crucial, the integration, full integration of producers, agronomies, industries in, a, in a, a single supply chain, in a coordinated supply chain uh, where uh, you know, they can achieve scale where they can get finance. So in, in the Almeria model, so I would say it has been pretty powerful, the, the finance since the beginning, the financial sector, and all of that has promoted that innovation and that thing that Germán was mentioning in the beginning of the morning, that sharing of wealth uh, created in Almeria, that's crucial. And, and for sure, that, that's a, a, I would say that's a relevant model to imitate in, in some other countries. Just maintaining a small farmers, that's keeping those small farmers, but adding them as, as, a, as an army of ants, I would say, if you let me put the, the comparison. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There was another question here. Yeah, great, thank you. Yes, my question is, uh, what are the techno technological constraints uh, to increase the presence of bio-input uh, products into the market and displacing uh, chemical products uh, in categories just like bio-herbicides, for example? No? Uh, because up to now, bio-inputs uh, are interesting, they have many promises, but up to now they are kind of marginal compared with uh, chemicals. What, what, would, what are the challenges? What should, should you do? Uh, what are the promises in the short and medium and long term? Okay, so the technological constraints. Well, I think that bioherbicides is probably one of the most difficult products to develop because it has to be systemic. You, know? you can do contact pro uh, products. Uh, I think there is a lot of knowledge to be developed in that field and so we are developing a couple of bioherbicides but you have many weeds, uh, there are a lot of challenges around it. No? So probably in the future we will be able to understand how we can develop natural products that are systemic and that can kill the, the, the plants that we want okay? and that's, that's difficult. Adoption. For me, I mean, and that's my personal opinion, adoption has to do with the, how the industry is set up. I think that uh, you have a lot of barriers that are not removed. Registration is one. Second is the fact that uh, I think that the distribution channel has to evolve and become a more service oriented than just product movement. And the growers also need to understand what are the, how you can manage crops and be, and that's a challenge, uh, differently, but with the same productivity, which is it's like the quadratura del circulo, not to make the, the square circle. So I, I think that there are, and that's what makes the industry interesting, and that's why I'm here. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in many fields. I think it's a blue ocean for new technology and new ways of management uh, and I foresee that a lot of managers for other industries will, will join the agriculture just to help us to change it. That's my Only to, to add some comments. Uh, mm, regulation 
to change the regulation is uh, crucial. Uh, I used to, to say many many times when I, I with people of the European Commission that this I don't understand how they are giving us millions of euros to research and to develop this kind of bio bio pesticide product and then the regulation is a very important barrier. Uh, I can be uh, obtaining some some bio pesticide product, but uh, then uh, or in the end. Uh, to put in market, at minimum seven years and uh, three, four millions of euros or more. So um, we we need to 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 change. We need to to adapt our leg and frame, or uh, for example, uh, copying uh, example like like in Brazil or other countries. For example, uh, we, with us, with we have some uh, biopesticide product order already registered in other uh, countries as biopesticide, but in Europe, for example, it's impossible to do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just to add, the, quest, the, I mean, the answer to the question is lobbyism in Brussels. <laughs> okay. Change the policy. Okay. So I've been given my last five-minute warning, so we have time for one more question. Loads of hands. So <laughs> whoever you get to first. I'm sorry that we'll be out of time after this question. Hello, good morning. Thank you for the very interesting uh, conversation. I have a question that's more related to the uh, infrastructure. Um, it's related to the amount of plastic that's used in CEA here in this region. There's 30,000 hectares of greenhouses. The plastic has to be changed every, I don't know, five years or so. Is that, is that an issue? What happens to it? Um, are, are you seeing this as mm -hmm. a as an issue, how is it dealt with? Great question. Okay, who wants to take that one? The plastic, where does it go? Uh, I, I don't think we have that, the answer. The only thing that I can say is that before in my life I worked in Repsol and they were taking care of the plastic here in Almeria. I don't know okay. what are they doing. I know that I take, they are taking care of the plastics, but I'm not more okay. knowledgeable about it. Okay, well then maybe we'll take one more question and this gentleman here in the front. If, I can repeat it if you want to shout it, because I think the mic... Is the microphone still there? Oh, okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so for people who couldn't hear that, it was uh, commenting on the impact of genetics on productivity improvements. So maybe final comments from the panel. Who'd like to comment on that contribution? Absolutely, and uh, it's true, and everything practically is coming because now with the gene editing, we are going to be able to multiply that positive effect of the genetic in agriculture, but uh, also coming back to the regulation in EU, we need to move fast, uh, we need to change and to open our mind. Uh, it's, a, it's a pity in the beginning Practically, CRISPR was born it in Europe, but then we are late in, in this kind of technology, and we need to adapt as soon as possible. So uh, I would say you, you are, I fully agree with what you are mentioning. So genetics has been pretty important in the last decades. Um, but I would say more than that, in, in 20th century, in agri-food has been the century of chemistry, of non-discriminated chemistry. So for everything we've used chemistry. This century is going to be the century of genetics, biochemistry, biology, data, and physics. In fact, we were mentioning before, we were talking about um, biological uh, herbicides and so on. So probably that won't happen. So uh, apart from the technical reasons, uh, is because uh, the oldest way to eliminate weeds has been physically. And why not doing it with robots? We are pretty close to it. And we have in this country, for example, 5.7 million hectares of trees that in the middle of the, of the lines, they have weeds 
And why do we eliminate those weeds with chemistry? Why don't we eliminate them with robots? We have already today robots cleaning the floors of our houses. So in the next very few years, we will see robots eliminating weeds. So, and 21st century will be the, the century of robotics, physics, and eliminating weeds physically as our grandparents were doing it before. And then I fully agree with my partners in this uh, round table that we need less lawyers or at least um, faster lawyers and more engineers in the European Union if we want to uh, progress. Okay, mm. thank you. Thank you, sorry, we have to cut this short now. So a round of applause for all the participants. Thank you very much.